Good morning, everybody. Before we start, I just want to know, is there anybody here with anything they would like to praise the Lord with? Don't come up to the front. We don't have a mic. You can just stand up where you are and maybe talk a little louder and just say what you're thankful for. Make sure you stand up so we can tell who's speaking. Amen. Trent. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm thankful that we're having graduation, and I'm thankful for our graduates. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful about my uh, family at home, my grandchildren, my daughter. It's really a blessing down here. And I'm also thankful for the little providences that happen day by day in our lives. You know, I find so often that uh, God gives us just what we need, just when we need it. And, you know, this week I, I went off and left my school box. Amen. Um, Thursday night, my husband sent me a message that our barn burnt down at home. And I'm really thankful we had a car park there that sort of protected the rest of our, our house. And my husband's face, I'm really thankful for that. Wow. Anybody else? Amen. Amen. You realize that we are very much in the minority here being able to worship because this is our fifth Sabbath. There are many, many today in the U.S. who still have not met in their church yet. Uh, I'm not sure if that is the majority either or if we're the majority, but I think that they're the majority. I think Michigan's still on shutdown for a couple more weeks. So, um, Heather? Amen. All right, well, we're still on an abbreviated worship service, so it's basically song service and sermon and closing song, and that's it. Um, at the end, if you have an, uh, your offering, they have been collecting it at the end as you go out. So uh, I know that Jerry's been asking whoever does the sound, what's the title of the sermon so they can mark it down for the live stream and all that. So this one is called The Change, okay? Let's bow our heads, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, as we come to you this beautiful Sabbath morning, we thank you for the let up on the rain, and we thank you for such beautiful weather that we've been able to receive. I thank you for each and every one that has been faithfully attending, and we thank you for health and strength. We sometimes forget about these things, that we have been very blessed to not have any illness and we're grateful for that. We thank you also for the opportunity to be able to come and worship here on this Sabbath day. And we're also thankful that we are living in a time period where we can see prophecies being unfolded right before our eyes. We're thankful that we can be living right before the coming of Christ. And Father, I ask and pray now that you would anoint my lips and that you would speak through my words this morning. Guide and direct, and may it fall upon a heart that is receptive. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9.
I've always uh, assimilated my life very closely with Paul's life. Because a lot of things that what Paul went through, I've experienced in my own life. And so I want to take you through this particular aspect that I, I don't think I've ever fully preached on. And that's Saul's conversion experience that he went through. In Acts chapter 9, verse 1, it starts off by saying, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. You notice that word then. It's a carryover. Remember, in the past, they never had um, verses. They didn't have chapters. So this is a culmination of all the different things that Paul's been do or Saul's been doing. And then it says, then he's still doing these things. And he went to the high priests and he asked letters for them, from them to the synagogues of Damascus so that, he, that if he found any who were of the way, meaning followers of Christ, whether men or women, he would bring them bound to Jerusalem. Saul was bent hard on wiping out these so-called Christians. He was tired of them. I mean, you can't imagine. This is almost like going to the judge and asking the judge, look, give me a letter, a warrant, so I can break into the homes and I can find out who these Christians really are. That's a foretaste of what's coming, by the way. Because they're not going to ask for a warrant from the judge. They're just going to break into your home. You've watched the news. You've seen all the things that have happened this week. There's a lot of foolishness. There's a lot of craziness. There's a lot of lives that are being lost and a lot of stupid things as a result of lives being lost. We're living at the end. Expect all the things that you could say by saying you can't do that. Well, guess what? Everything that can't be done will be done. And we're at that time period right now where all these laws of can'ts and don'ts and won'ts, it's all going to be lost because we're at the end. And as Saul journeyed, he came to Damascus. And suddenly a light shone from heaven. He fell to the ground. He heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. They arose from their feet. Now this is all that the scripture really accounts for in this whole process. And I appreciate it. And it really opens my eyes. But there, if you lift up a magnifying glass, remember... The spirit of prophecy has been given to us. And I like the way that Elder Robert Pearson closed off a meeting when he had at the general conference session talking to the ministerial over there. He said, talking about the spirit of prophecy, he said, imagine you are the captain of a very large sailing vessel. And you are sailing from one harbor overseas to another harbor. You get up there on the bridge and you lay the high seas map out and it gives you all the details that you need to go from one harbor safely to the other harbor. But as you get closer to that harbor, the water begins to get more shallow. And as a result of that, he doesn't know where the sandbars are. He doesn't know where the coral reefs are. And he awaits alongside and this tiny little boat just comes alongside that big sailing vessel and they let down a ladder, and climbing up that ladder is the harbor master. And the harbor master takes his map and lays it right on top of the, the captain's high seas map. And the difference is, it, they're exactly the same. But the harbor map 
gives all the greater detail to take that ship safely into port. And that's what the spirit of prophecy does for us. And I hope and pray that you have a hungering and a thirsting for that. I want to take you through what we just read in greater detail now. You see, Saul was nevertheless, he was a Jew himself. He was a descendant of a Jew. He had been educated in Jerusalem. Not educated just by any old scholar. He was educated by the most eminent of rabbis. I mean, he was at the Harvard Yale School of Judaism. He was so educated. I mean, if, if there was, you ever met somebody with all these degrees that they give you a business card and that those MD, PhDs, MA, uh, MPH, it kind of wraps around the card and goes around the back? This was, this was Saul. It says he was regarded by the rabbis as a young man of great promise, and high hopes were cherished for him. Why? Because he had proven himself to be such a zealous defender of the ancient faith. He was so ardent, he was so committed to this. And it says his elevation to membership in the Sanhedrin Council proved that he was in a position of power. And he knew that. He knew that the whole time. And he had taken advantage of this, and Saul, having the most prominent part in this, of the trial, and off the conviction of who? Stephen. Stephen. I mean, can you imagine? He looked at Stephen with such evil in his eyes. He wanted nothing but to snuff Stephen's life out. We're told here that the striking evidence of God's presence with the martyr had led Saul to doubt the righteousness of the cause he had espoused against the followers of Jesus. He just had such bitter opposition to the doctrines that were taught by Jesus. Why? Because he was so ingrained that this is what you believe. You know, sometimes when you are raised a particular way, you're almost brainwashed. And you can't get beyond that thinking because this is what you were told. This is how you were brought up. And you know the saying, it holds very true. We parent many times the way we were parented. You've heard that before? Those of you who are parents, you ever had those flashbacks of your mom or dad saying those very same words to you and you're like, ah, because you promised yourself you were never going to do that. And yet you say the very words they said. Why? Because it was ingrained inside your head. We're told that his activity in causing holy men and women to be dragged before tribunals. They were condemned into prison. Some even were put to death solely because of their faith in Jesus. You know, you actually have to live the life you profess to believe in order to be found that way. Do you believe that? You can't just hold it up inside and, you know, once in a while, flash, I'm a Christian sign. It doesn't work that way. I've coined a new term now. I posted it on uh, social media last night. Because everything's about social distancing today. Is it not? Keep yourself away. Here's my phrase. You heard it here first. Social witnessing. Not social distancing. That's last week's message. The message that says... It's not about you, but it is. Because it is about you. It's about you being a Christian. It's about you living the faith that you profess to believe. If there's one thing I've always been passionate about here, it's about witnessing and it's about sharing your faith. Correct? Because... 
Saul was after these people. Many of them ran for their lives. Where did they run to? Well, we were told over 100 years ago by Mrs. White that we were supposed to be out of the cities. Over 100 years ago. Can you imagine this COVID stuff that hit? Now, I had not even thought of following through, but there was a big cyclone that was hitting India, part of India and Bangladesh, and it was all amidst all this COVID stuff, all this social distancing that was supposed to be taking place, and they didn't have very much food to begin with. Why wouldn't they have much food? You know, for us, we just go to the refrigerator. I remember when I was in Cambodia preaching for a camp meeting, and the translator was translating. I said something about translating a refrigerator. He looked at me, and he kept pre translating. And I said, you all have refrigerators, right? And nobody raised their hand. I looked at him, and I said, um, did you translate that correctly? He says, yeah. I explained to them refrigerator. I said, do you know what do you understand? Yeah, he says, I know what a refrigerator is. You put your food in it, it keeps it cold. I said, yeah, but nobody raised their hand. <laughs> he said, of course not. They don't have a front door. Why do they need a refrigerator? And we're spoiled. We're spoiled because whatever we need, we just go get. But imagine if you're in the city. Some of you who are younger, you're going to grow up if time should last. You might find yourself funneled into the city. Why? Because that's where all the jobs are. That's where the big pay is at. But what if it's amid all the COVID stuff and you can't go out and find food, let alone toilet paper? And then the power goes off. And then the water goes off. you would wish that you were back in Jefferson. In Saul's situation here, the priests and the rulers had hoped that by a vigilant effort on Saul's behalf, he would do a lot of damage. It's regarded here, and it says, for the work they had desired to have been done at Damascus, Saul offered his services. Send me. I'll go do the work. He was breathing out threats and slaughters against all the disciples of Christ. If any were found, who regardless, whether you're a father, whether you're a grandfather, whether you have a nursing babe, doesn't matter. You were dragged out and bound, and you were taken to Jerusalem, put before the courts just like Stephen was. But then something happened. Something happened along the way. Spirit of Prophecy says here, on the last day of the journey at midday, about noon, as the weary travelers neared Damascus, they were about to go in. They came within full view of the broad stretches of fertile land, beautiful gardens, fruitful orchards, watered by cool streams from surrounding mountains. I saw all this just a few weeks ago when I was on the ride, especially when you hit California. Man, you, you get into this commercial agriculture area and you are riding and riding for miles and miles and miles. And you see all this agriculture growing. The big, huge water pipes that are funneling water in there. You see the aquifers where they're watering all these plants and they're lush. But you touch one of those plants and you get caught, they'll stick you in prison. Paul saw, Saul saw all this stuff. And we're told here that after the long journey over desolate and waste, such scenes were refreshing indeed. And while Saul and his companions gazing with admiration on the fruitful plain in the far city below, suddenly there shone all around them a light from heaven. Now remember, it's midday. The sun is blasting bright. I don't know about you, but have you ever looked up at the sun? Look up at the sun just for 10 seconds, 
and then look everywhere else. It's so, it's, it's dark because you've just looked at the sun. Saul here and his companions around him. The brightness that came down from the heavens was so bright that it blinded him so much so that it just knocked him off. Now, we're not sure if he was on a horse or if he was walking, but it was so bright that it said he fell prostrate to the ground. While the light continued to shine all about him, Saul heard a voice. That's what Acts 9 tells us. It said he heard a voice speaking to him. Now, did that voice just come ambiently, surround sound from heaven? It says here, in the most... in. The glorious being, sorry, let me back up for a second. Filled with fear and almost blinded by the intensity of the light, the companions of Saul heard a voice, but they saw no man. But Saul understood the words that were spoken to him, and to him was clearly revealed the one who spoke. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, they didn't see anybody, but Saul, through the brightness, he saw somebody who was speaking to him. And it says, Revealed in the one that was spoken was the Son of God. In the glorious being who stood before him, he saw the crucified one. Upon the soul of the stricken Jew, the image of the Savior's countenance was imprinted forever. Imagine that. It was just impregnated on his mind never to be removed. Saul now saw in persecuting the followers of Jesus that he in reality had actually been doing the work of Satan. He saw that his convictions of right and of his only duty had been basely, based largely on his implicit confidence in the priests and the rulers. He believed that he was actually the one doing the right work. He was convinced of the truth. But in that hour, it says, we don't know if it was really an hour. It doesn't say in that moment, but it just says in that hour of hem heavenly illumination, Saul's mind acted with remarkable rapidity. It says the prophetic records of Holy Writ were open to his understanding. All of a sudden, it was like a fiber optic download came into his mind and he was able to really grasp what are you doing what am i doing here what have i been doing to all these people and he said he saw that the rejection of jesus by the jews his crucifixion his resurrection his ascension had been foretold by the prophets and proved him to be the promised messiah can you imagine how saul felt all of a sudden by thinking what have I been doing? What have I been doing this whole time? And then, like a flashback, Stephen's sermon at the time of his martyrdom was brought forcibly to Saul's mind, and he realized that the martyr had indeed beheld the glory of God. When Stephen said, Behold, I see the heavens open." and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. We're told that now Saul knew for a certainty that the promised Messiah had come to this earth as Jesus of Nazareth, and that he had been rejected. He was crucified by those whom he actually came to save. He also knew that the Savior had ridden, risen in triumph from the tomb and ascended into heaven. In that moment of divine revelation, Saul remembered with terror what he had done with Stephen. You know, when I think of, when I read this, that word remember came to my mind. 
I shared it with people as I was writing about remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Doesn't Jesus say, I will remember your sins no more? That's wonderful. But when he does remember them, and he does bring them back to our forethought, that's not a good time period. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because if those sins come back to us that were supposed to be buried, never to come up again, what, well, then the question is, why would they come up again? When we confess our sins, they are buried in the depths of the sea. But if we don't actually live for Christ wholeheartedly all the way to the end, somehow those sins get airbags and they start rising to the surface. All of them. Every single one of those sins that you have sought forgiveness for comes back to you. And the change that you had professed is not there anymore. You don't want God to remember your past sins. I don't want God to remember my past sins. We are told that he He went through many things. Do you think in that moment Saul was in mental anguish? I think definitely. I mean, I could see him just taking his hands and squeezing his head, bawling his eyes out. We don't know if it really was an hour or if it was a moment but I can tell you this it was long enough that Saul remembered everything he had done everything and then we're told in Acts of the Apostles when the glory was withdrawn and Saul rose from the ground he found himself totally deprived of sight the blindness of Christ's glory had been too intense for his mortal eyes. And when it was removed, the blackness of night settled upon his vision. He believed that the blindness, he believed that the blindness was a punishment from God for his cruel persecution of the followers of Jesus. In terrible darkness, it said he groped around and his companions in fear and amazement led him by the hands, and brought him into Damascus. Why didn't his companions not lose their sight? Why? They were all right there. They saw the light. They didn't hear the voice. They saw the light, too. Could it be that they were blind? When God speaks to us through the word, through the sermon, I'm preaching, you're listening. And when you go out from here, each one of you will get something totally different out of this message. Something totally different. Many of you will have the same thoughts. Some of you will think that I was pinpointing you on some sin when I have no idea what it was. It's just the Holy Spirit pricking your own heart. Others of you, well, he's not talking about me. He's talking about somebody else. They led Saul by the hand. So if they led him by the hand, then certainly he could not have been on the horse. You ever play that game when somebody's got you blindfolded and they're leading you? I can tell you this. Saul was not walking on blacktop. It wasn't smooth. And he probably stumbled several times as they're leading him down this road to Damascus. Can you imagine that? You're hot, you're sweaty, the sun's beating on you, you can't see, you're disorientated, you may even kind of lose balance because you don't have a visual to lock in on. 
he was instructed to go to, do you remember the name of that street? Straight, straight Street. I'll tell you what, it was probably straight. On the morning, it says, of that eventful day, Saul had neared Damascus with feelings of self-satisfaction because of the confidence he had been placed in by himself, to himself by the chief priests. To him had been entrusted grave responsibility. He was commissioned to further the interests of Jewish religion by checking, if possible, the spreading of new faith. He was going in as the Gestapo. Now it says, as he sat there, knowing not what further judgment might be in store for him. Can you imagine the torment of that? I don't know what else God's going to do to me now. He sought out the home of the disciple Judas, where, in solitude, he had ample opportunity for reflection and prayer. Here's the details. For three days, Saul was without sight, and neither did eat or drink. These days of soul agony were to him as years. Again and again, he recalled with anguish of spirit the part he had taken in the martyrdom of Stephen. With horror, he thought of his guilt in allowing himself to be controlled by the malice and prejudice of the priests and the rulers, even in the face of Stephen, had been lighted up with the radiance of heaven. In sadness and brokenness of spirit, he recounted the many times he had closed his eyes and his ears against the most striking evidence and had relentlessly urged on the persecution of the believers of Jesus in Nazareth. You know what that reminds me of? When conviction comes to our heart, when we hear something that we should be convicted of, something that troubles us, we need to stop right then and we need to pray and ask the Lord, convict my heart. But usually what happens is we turn around to whoever said it or wherever we read it and we look at that source as a troublemaker. When it's really the Holy Spirit saying, I'm speaking to you. Forget about where that came from. Those are my words because I'm the one knocking at your door. I'm the one telling you that the life that you are living, the things that you are doing, the, the stuff that you are watching, the things that you are eating, the things that you are drinking, all those things are wrong because it's sin. And you need to stop it. But so often than not, we turn to the source and say, you're the troublemaker, when really, we're the one in trouble. It says, in sadness and brokenness of spirit, he recounted the many times he had closed his eyes and ears against the most striking evidence. But then it says, these days of self, uh, these days of close, close self-examination and the heart humiliation were spent in lonely seclusion. Do you know what lonely seclusion is? It's beyond social distancing. It's riding 2,500 miles across the U.S. in 45 days, sitting there on a bike with nobody around. Nobody. And people got on me, on the, my journals, that how could you be doing this stuff because you're affecting, infecting hundreds of people. Sure, they're going by me at 75 miles an hour in a car. How am I going to cough on them? I had a lot of time to think. I was not like Saul or Paul at that point because I had to keep my eyes open. But during the long hours when Saul was shut in by God alone, it says he recalled many of the passages of Scripture, 
referring to the first advent of Christ. Carefully, he traced down the prophecies with a memory sharpened by the conviction that had taken possession of his mind. Look, if you have a desire to learn Scripture, if you have a desire to memorize Scripture, if you have a desire to learn prophecies, God can teach you in the moment, in a moment, what the great men of the earth cannot teach you in a lifetime. But you must desire it for yourself. But if you have no desire, if you just long for the worldly stuff, that's all you're going to get. And no matter how much your mouth says you want to draw close to God, your heart is going the other way. Shut yourself in with God. It says, as he reflected on the meaning of these prophecies, he was astonished at his former blindness of understanding and at the blindness of the Jews in general, which had led the rejection of Jesus as the promised Messiah to his enlightened vision, all now seemed clear. He understood it. It was all laid out before him. But something just impressed my mind. But why? Why him at that moment? I don't know. I don't know why. He did not desire to want to be that way. Not at all. Perhaps the Lord looks beyond the surface, beyond the hard shell, and he looks beyond that to be able to see a heart that would be inclined to doing his will. That's how the children of Israel were chosen. They weren't chosen just because they were the strongest. They, they weren't chosen because of their, their numbers. They were chosen because they were the most inclined to doing God's will. And God's not looking for the most prestigious, the most educated. He is looking for the one who is willing to want to follow. And it says, to his enlightened vision, all now seem plain. He knew that his former prejudice and unbelief had clouded his spiritual perception and it prevented him from discerning in Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah of prophecy. We've all gone through many roads. We've all gone through challenging times, correct? Some of us have been challenged. Some of us challenge people. My life has been challenged. My life has been changed a lot. It's changed a lot because we're all on a different level growing. Some grow slower than others. Some can grow instantly. But I thank God for his mercy because he allows us to grow in such a way so long as we are following the prompting of the Holy Spirit, not skipping and saying, okay, I'll try it once every 10 years. Life is always a challenge. If there was no challenges, it'd be a little too easy, wouldn't it? And with the challenges... We have to make changes. How many of you have felt that through Saul's story here, 
perhaps I need to make a change, you could say. I need to make a change in my life. Can I see your hands? Amen. Well, I can tell you this. I need to make a change. And you have all helped me make the change. So, as I close off this chapter of my life, I begin a new chapter in my life. A new chapter where I don't have old baggage. And I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to serve at this church for the last seven years. But this will be my last Sabbath with you. Benny has asked me to continue on with taking charge of camp meeting. So camp meeting will continue on as scheduled. There will be no children's programming, but it will be from Wednesday evening till Sunday morning. And then we'll be preparing for a move. But I solicit your prayers and... um, I know it's been a challenge, but I thank you that you have challenged my life and you have changed my life, each and every one of you, in your own way. And I know, without a doubt, that I am closer to God because of those changes. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you that you are always there for us and that you always encourage us and you're always willing to make changes if we ourselves will place our lives on the altar of sacrifice. Continue to lead us. Continue to lead this church. Continue to lead the members of this church as much as they're willing to be led. Father, we are living in the most peculiar time period of this world's history. Everything is stretched one way and the other. Nothing is going to ever be the same anymore. It's because we know that Jesus is coming very soon. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to work upon each and every heart here, that you would draw near to them and that you would prepare them for your soon coming, for what is to come upon this earth before that soon coming. May they be faithful to you in all aspects of their lives. Be with us continue to lead and guide my family as well. We thank you for this opportunity and we look forward to that wonderful time when we can all get to heaven and sing praises to your name. For we ask and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.